Section nine of a little tour in France by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty. The history of Toulouse is detestable, saturated with blood and perfidy, and the ancient custom of the floral games, grafted upon all sorts of internecine traditions, seems with its false pastoralism, its mock chivalry, its display of fine feelings, to set off rather than to mitigate these horrors. The society was founded in the fourteenth century, and it has held annual meetings ever since, meetings at which poems in the fine old long dock are declaimed and a blushing laureate is chosen. This business takes place in the capital, before the chief magistrate of the town, who is known as the Capitoul, and of all the pretty women as well, a class very numerous at Toulouse. It was impossible to have a finer person than that of the portress who pretended to show me the apartments in which the floral games are held, a big, brown, expansive woman, still in the prime of life, with a speaking eye, an extraordinary assurance, and a pair of magenta stockings, which were inserted into the neatest and most polished little black sabot, and which, as she clattered up the stairs before me, lavishly displaying them, made her look like the heroine of an opera bouffe. Her talk was all in N's, G's, and D's, and mute E's strongly accented, as in autre, théâtre, splendide, the last being an epithet she applied to everything the capital contained, and especially to a horrible picture representing the famous Clémence Isor, the reputed foundress of the poetical contest, presiding on one of these occasions. I wondered whether Clémence Isor had been anything like this terrible Toulousaine of to-day, who would have been a capital figurehead for a floral game. The lady in whose honour the picture I have just mentioned was painted is a somewhat mythical personage, and she is not to be found in the Biographie Universelle. She is, however, a very graceful myth, and if she never existed, her statue does at least, a shapeless effigy, transferred to the capital from the so-called tomb of Clémence in the old church of La Dorade. The great hall in which the floral games are held was encumbered with scaffoldings, and I was unable to admire the long series of busts of the bards who have won prizes and the portraits of all the capitoul of Toulouse. As a compensation, I was introduced to a big bookcase filled with the poems that have been crowned since the days of the troubadours, a portentous collection, and the big butcher's knife with which, according to Lenjard, Henry, Duke of Montmorency, who had conspired against the great cardinal with Gaston of Orléans and Mary de Medici, was, in 1632, beheaded on this spot by order of Richelieu. With these objects, the interest of the capital was exhausted. The building, indeed, has not the grandeur of its name, which is a sort of promise that the visitor will find some sensible embodiment of the old Roman tradition that once flourished in this part of France. It is inferior in impressiveness to the other three famous capitals of the modern world, that of Rome, if I may call the present structure modern, and those of Washington and Albany. The only Roman remains at Toulouse are to be found at the museum, a very interesting establishment which I was condemned to see as imperfectly as I had the capital. It was being rearranged, and the gallery of paintings, which is the least interesting feature, was the only part that was not upside down. The pictures are mainly of the modern French school, and I remember nothing but a powerful, though disagreeable, specimen of Hune who paints the human body, and paints it so well, with a brush dipped in blackness, and placed among the paintings a bronze replica of the charming young David of Mercier. These things have been set out in the church of an old monastery long since suppressed, and the rest of the collection occupies the cloisters. These are two in number, a small one, which you enter first from the street, and a very vast and elegant one beyond it, which, with its light Gothic arches and slim columns of the fourteenth century, its broad walk, its little garden, with old tombs and statues in the centre, is by far the most picturesque, the most sketchable spot in Toulouse. 
It must be doubly so when the Roman busts, inscriptions, slabs, and sarcophagi are ranged along the walls. It must indeed, to compare small things with great, and, as the judicious Murray remarks, bear a certain resemblance to the Campo Santo at Pisa. But these things are absent now. The cloister is a litter of confusion, and its treasures have been stowed away confusedly in sundry inaccessible rooms. The custodian attempted to console me by telling me that when they are exhibited again it will be on a scientific basis, and with an order and regularity of which they were formerly innocent. But I was not consoled. I wanted simply the spectacle, the picture, and I didn't care in the least for the classification. Old Roman fragments, exposed to light in the open air, under a southern sky, in a quadrangle round a garden, have an immortal charm simply in their general effect, and the charm is all the greater when the soil of the very place has yielded them up. Chapter 21 my real consolation was an hour I spent in saint Cernin, one of the noblest churches in southern France, and easily the first among those of Toulouse. What makes it so is the extraordinary seriousness of its interior. No other term occurs to me as expressing so well the character of its clear, great nave. As a general thing, I do not favour the fashion of attributing moral qualities to buildings. I shrink from talking about tender porticos and sincere campanili, but I find I cannot get on at all without imputing some sort of morality to saint Cernin. As it stands today, the church has been completely restored by Viollet-le-Duc. The exterior is of brick and has little charm save that of a tower of four rows of arches, narrowing together as they ascend. The nave is of great length and height, the barrel roof of stone, the effect of the round arches and pillars in the triforium especially fine. There are two low aisles on either side. The choir is very deep and narrow. It seems to close together and looks as if it were meant for intensely earnest rites. The transepts are most noble, especially the arches of the second tier. The whole church is narrow for its length and is singularly complete and homogeneous. As I say all this, I feel that I quite fail to give an impression of its manly gravity, its strong proportions, or of the lonesome look of its renovated stones as I sat there while the October twilight gathered. It is a real work of art, a high conception. The crypt into which I was eventually led captive by an importunate sacristan is quite another affair though indeed I suppose it may also be spoken of as a work of art. It is a rich museum of relics, and contains the head of St. Thomas Aquinas, wrapped up in a napkin and exhibited in a glass case. The sacristan took a lamp and guided me about, presenting me to one saintly remnant after another. The impression was grotesque, but some of the objects were contained in curious old cases of beaten silver and brass, these things, at least, which looked as if they had been transmitted from the early church, were venerable. There was, however, a kind of wholesale sanctity about the place which overshot the mark. It pretends to be one of the holiest spots in the world. The effect is spoiled by the way the sacristans hang about and offer to take you into it for ten sous. I was accosted by two and escaped from another, and by the familiar manner in which you pop in and out. This episode rather broke the charm of saint Cernin, so that I took my departure and went in search of the cathedral. It was scarcely worth finding, and struck me as an odd, dislocated fragment. The front consists only of a portal, beside which a tall brick tower of a later period has been erected. The nave was wrapped in dimness with a few scattered lamps. I could only distinguish an immense vault like a high cavern without aisles. Here and there in the gloom was a kneeling figure. The whole place was mysterious and lopsided. The choir was curtained off. It appeared not to correspond with the nave, that is, not to have the same axis. The only other ecclesiastical impression I gathered at Toulouse came to me in the church of La Dorade, of which the front, on the quay by the Garonne, was closed with scaffoldings, 
so that one entered it from behind, where it is completely masked by houses, through a door which has at first no traceable connection with it. It is a vast, high, modernized, heavily decorated church, dimly lighted at all times, I should suppose, and enriched by the shades of evening at the time I looked into it. I perceived that it consisted mainly of a large square beneath a dome, in the centre of which a single person, a lady, was praying with the utmost absorption. The manner of access to the church interposed such an obstacle to the outer profanities that I had a sense of intruding, and presently withdrew, carrying with me a picture of the vast, still interior, the gilded roof gleaming in the twilight, and the solitary worshipper. What was she praying for, and was she not almost afraid to remain there alone? For the rest, the picturesque at Toulouse consists principally of the walk beside the Garonne, which is spanned to the Faubourg of Saint-Cyprien by a stout brick bridge. This hapless suburb, the baseness of whose site is noticeable, lay for days under the water at the time of the last inundations. The Garonne had almost mounted to the roofs of the houses, and the place continues to present a blighted, frightened look. Two or three persons, with whom I had some conversation, spoke of that time as a memory of horror. I have not done with my Italian comparisons. I shall never have done with them. I am therefore free to say that in the way in which Toulouse looks out on the Garonne, there was something that reminded me vaguely of the way in which Pisa looks out on the Arno. The red-faced houses, all of brick, along the quay, have a mixture of brightness and shabbiness, as well as the fashion of the open loggia in the top story. The river, with another bridge or two, might be the Arno, and the buildings on the other side of it, a hospital, a suppressed convent, dip their feet into it with real southern cynicism. I have spoken of the old Hôtel d'Assesa as the best house at Toulouse, with the exception of the cloister of the museum, it is the only bit I remember. It has fallen from the state of a noble residence of the sixteenth century to that of a warehouse and a set of offices, but a certain dignity lingers in its melancholy court, which is divided from the street by a gateway that is still imposing, and in which a clambering vine and a red Virginia creeper were suspended to the rusty walls of brick stone. The most interesting house at Toulouse is far from being the most striking. At the door of number 50 Rue des Filatiers, a featureless solid structure, was found hanging one autumn evening the body of the young Marc-Antoine Callas, whose ill-inspired suicide was to be the first act of a tragedy so horrible. The fanaticism aroused in the townsfolk by this incident, the execution by torture of Jean Calas, accused as a Protestant of having hanged his son who had gone over to the Church of Rome, the ruin of the family, the claustration of the daughters, the flight of the widow to Switzerland, her introduction to Voltaire, the excited zeal of that incomparable partisan, and the passionate persistence with which, from year to year, he pursued a reversal of judgment, till at last he obtained it, and devoted the tribunal of Toulouse to execration and the name of the victims to lasting wonder and pity, these things form part of one of the most interesting and touching episodes of the social history of the eighteenth century. The story has the fatal progression, the dark rigidity, of one of the tragic dramas of the Greeks. Jean Calas, advanced in life, blameless, bewildered, protesting his innocence, had been broken on the wheel, and the sight of his decent dwelling, which brought home to me all that had been suffered there, spoiled for me, for half an hour, the impression of Toulouse. CHAPTER Twenty Two. I spent but a few hours at Carcassonne, but those hours had a rounded felicity, and I cannot do better than transcribe from my notebook the little record made at the moment. Vitiated as it may be by crudity and incoherency, it has at any rate the freshness of a great emotion. This is the best quality that a reader may hope to extract from a narrative in which useful information and technical lore, even of the most general sort, are completely absent. For Carcassonne is moving, beyond a doubt, 
and the traveller who in the course of a little tour in France may have felt himself urged in melancholy moments to say on the whole the disappointments are as numerous as the satisfactions, must admit that there can be nothing better than this. The country, after you leave Toulouse, continues to be charming, the more so that it merges its flatness in the distant Cévennes on one side, and on the other, far away on your right, in the richer range of the Pyrenees. Olives and cypresses, pergolas and vines, terraces on the roofs of houses, soft iridescent mountains, a warm yellow light, what more could the difficult tourist want? He left his luggage at the station, warily determined to look at the inn before committing himself to it. It was so evident, even to a cursory glance, that it might easily have been much better, that he simply took his way to the town with the whole of a superb afternoon before him. When I say the town, I mean the towns, there being two at Carcassonne, perfectly distinct, and each with excellent claims to the title. They have settled the matter between them, however, and the elder, the shrine of pilgrimage, to which the other is but a stepping-stone, or even, as I may say, a humble doormat, takes the name of the Cité. You see nothing of the Cité from the station. It is masked by the agglomeration of the Ville Basse, which is relatively, but only relatively, new. A wonderful avenue of acacias leads to it from the station. It leads past, rather, and conducts you to a little high-backed bridge over the Aude, beyond which, detached and erect, a distinct medieval silhouette, the Cité presents itself. Like a rival shop on the invidious side of a street, it has no connection with the establishment across the way, although the two places are united, if old Carcassonne may be said to be united to anything, by a vague little rustic faubourg. Perched on its solid pedestal, the perfect detachment of the Cité is what first strikes you. To take leave without delay of the Ville Basse, I may say that the splendid acacias I have mentioned flung a summerish dusk over the place, in which a few scattered remains of stout walls and big bastions looked venerable and picturesque. A little boulevard winds round the town, planted with trees and garnished with more benches than I ever saw provided by a soft-hearted municipality. This precinct had a warm, lazy, dusty southern look, as if the people sat out of doors a great deal and wandered about in the stillness of summer nights. The figure of the elder town at these hours must be ghostly enough on its neighbouring hill. Even by day it has the air of a vignette of Gustave Doré, a couplet of Victor Hugo. It is almost too perfect, as if it were an enormous model, placed on a big green table at a museum. A steep paved way, grass-grown like all roads where vehicles never pass, stretches up to it in the sun. It has a double enceinte, complete outer walls, and complete inner. These, elaborately fortified, are the more curious. And this congregation of ramparts, towers, bastions, battlements, barbicans, is as fantastic and romantic as you please. The approach I mention here leads to the gate that looks toward Toulouse, the Porte de l'Aude. There is a second on the other side, called, I believe, the Porte Narbonnaise, a magnificent gate, flanked with towers thick and tall, defended by elaborate outworks, and these two apertures alone admit you to the place, putting aside a small sally-port protected by a great bastion on the quarter that looks toward the Pyrenees. As a votary, always, in the first instance, of a general impression, I walked all round the outer enceinte, a process on the very face of it entertaining. I took to the right of the Porte de l'Aude, without entering it, where the old moat has been filled in. The filling in of the moat has created a grassy level at the foot of the big grey towers, which, rising at frequent intervals, stretch their stiff curtain of stone from point to point. The curtain drops without a fold upon the quiet grass, which was dotted here and there with the humble native, dozing away the golden afternoon. The natives of the elder Carcassonne are all humble, for the core of the Cité has shrunken and decayed, and there is little life among the ruins. A few tenacious labourers who work in the neighbouring fields or in the Ville Basse, 
and sundry octogenarians of both sexes who are dying where they have lived and contribute much to the pictorial effect these are the principal inhabitants the process of converting the place from an irresponsible old town into a conscious specimen has of course been attended with eliminations the population has as a general thing been restored away i should lose no time in saying that restoration is the great mark of the cite m violet le duc has worked his will upon it put it into perfect order revived the fortifications in every detail i do not pretend to judge the performance carried out on a scale and in a spirit which really impose themselves on the imagination few architects have had such a chance and m violet le duc must have been the envy of the whole restoring fraternity the image of a more crumbling carcassonne rises in the mind and there is no doubt that forty years ago the place was more affecting on the other hand as we see it to-day it is a wonderful evocation and if there is a great deal of new in the old there is plenty of old in the new the repaired crenellations the inserted patches of the walls of the outer circle sufficiently express this commixture my walk brought me into full view of the pyrenees which now that the sun had begun to sink and the shadows to grow long had a wonderful violet glow the platform at the base of the walls has a greater width on this side and it made the scene more complete two or three old crones had crawled out of the porte d'arbonnaise to examine the advancing visitor and a very ancient peasant lying there with his back against a tower was tending half a dozen lean sheep a poor man in a very old blouse crippled and with crutches lying beside him had been brought out and placed on a stool where he enjoyed the afternoon as best he might he looked so ill and so patient that i spoke to him found that his legs were paralyzed and he was quite helpless he had formerly been seven years in the army and had made the campaign of mexico with bazaine born in the old cite he had come back there to end his days it seemed strange as he sat there with those romantic walls behind him and the great picture of the pyrenees in front to think that he had been across the seas to the far away new world had made part of a famous expedition and was now a cripple at the gate of the medieval city where he had played as a child all this struck me as a great deal of history for so modest a figure a poor little figure that could only just unclose its palm for a small silver coin he was not the only acquaintance i made at carcassonne i had not pursued my circuit of the walls much further when i encountered a person of quite another type of whom i asked some question which had just then presented itself and who proved to be the very genius of the spot he was a sociable son of the ville basse a gentleman and as i afterwards learned an employé at the prefecture a person in short much esteemed at carcassonne i may say all this as he will never read these pages he had been ill for a month and in the company of his little dog was taking his first airing in his own phrase he was amoureux fou de la cité he could lose no time in coming back to it he talked of it indeed as a lover and giving me for half an hour the advantage of his company showed me all the points of the place i speak here always of the outer enceinte you penetrate to the inner which is the specialty of carcassonne and the great curiosity only by application at the lodge of the regular custodian a remarkable functionary who half an hour later when i had been introduced to him by my friend the amateur marched me over the fortifications with a tremendous accompaniment of dates and technical terms my companion pointed out to me in particular the traces of different periods in the structure of the walls there is a portentous amount of history embedded in them beginning with romans and visigoths here and there there are marks of old breaches hastily repaired we passed into the town into that part of it not included in the citadel it is the queerest and most fragmentary little place in the world as everything save the fortifications is being suffered to crumble away in order that the spirit of m violet le duc alone may pervade it and it may subsist simply as a magnificent shell 
as the leases of the wretched little houses fall in the ground is cleared of them and a mumbling old woman approached me in the course of my circuit inviting me to condole with her on the disappearance of so many of the hovels which in the last few hundred years since the collapse of carcassonne as a stronghold had attached themselves to the base of the walls in the space between the two circles these habitations constructed of materials taken from the ruins nestled there snugly enough this intermediate space had therefore become a kind of street which has crumbled in turn as the fortress has grown up again there are other streets beside very diminutive and vague where you pick your way over heaps of rubbish and become conscious of unexpected faces looking at you out of windows as detached as the cherubic heads the most definite thing in the place was the little café, where the waiters, I think, must be the ghosts of the old Visigoths. The most definite, that is, after the little chateau and the little cathedral. Everything in the cité is little. You can walk round the walls in twenty minutes. On the drawbridge of the chateau, which, with the picturesque old face, flanking towers, and a dry moat, is today simply a bare caserne, lounged half a dozen soldiers usually small nothing could be more odd than to see these objects enclosed in a receptacle which has much of the appearance of an enormous toy the cite and its population vaguely reminded me of an immense noah's ark chapter twenty three carcassonne dates from the roman occupation of gaul the place commanded one of the great roads into spain and in the fourth century romans and franks ousted each other from such a point of vantage in the year four thirty six theodoric king of the visigoths superseded both these parties and it is during his occupation that the inner enceinte was raised upon the ruins of the roman fortifications most of the visigoth towers that are still erect are seated upon roman substructions which appear to have been formed hastily probably at the moment of the Frankish invasion. The authors of these solid defences, though occasionally disturbed, held Carcassonne and the neighbouring country, in which they had established their kingdom of Septimania, until the year 713, when they were expelled by the Moors of Spain, who ushered in an unillumined period of four centuries of which no traces remain. These facts I derived from a source no more recondite than a pamphlet by M. Viollet-le-Duc, a very luminous description of the fortifications which you may buy from the accomplished custodian. The writer makes a jump to the year 1209, when Carcassonne, then forming a part of the realm of the Viscounts of Béziers, and infected by the Albigensian heresy, was besieged in the name of the Pope by the terrible Simon de Montfort and his army of crusaders. Simon was accustomed to success, and the town succumbed in the course of a fortnight. Thirty-one years later, having passed into the hands of the King of France, it was again besieged by the young Raymond de Trincavel, the last of the Viscounts of Béziers, and of this siege M. Viollet-le-Duc gives a long and minute account which the visitor who has a head for such things may follow, with a brochure in hand, on the fortifications themselves. The young Raymond de Trincavel, baffled and repulsed, retired at the end of twenty-four days. Saint-Louis and Philip the Bold in the thirteenth century multiplied the defences of Carcassonne, which was one of the bulwarks of their kingdom on the Spanish quarter, and from this time forth being regarded as impregnable, the place had nothing to fear. It was not even attacked, and when, in 1355, Edward the Black Prince marched into it, the inhabitants had opened the gates to the conqueror before whom all Languedoc was prostrate. I am not one of those who, as I said just now, have a head for such things, and having extracted these few facts had made all the use of M. Viollet-le-Duc's pamphlet of which I am capable." I have mentioned that my obliging friend, the amoureux fou, handed me over to the doorkeeper of the citadel. I should add that I was at first committed to the wife of this functionary, a stout peasant woman who took a key down from a nail, conducted me to a postern door, and ushered me into the presence of her husband. Having just begun his rounds with a party of four persons, he was not many steps in advance. 
I added myself perforce to this party, which was not brilliantly composed, except that two of its members were gendarmes in full toggery, who announced in the course of our tour that they had been stationed for a year at Carcassonne, and had never before had the curiosity to come up to the Cité. There was something brilliant, certainly, in that. The Guardian was an extraordinarily typical little Frenchman, who struck me even more forcibly than the wonders of the inner enceinte, and, as I am bound to assume, at whatever cost to my literary vanity, that there is not the slightest danger of his reading these remarks, I may treat him as public property. With his diminutive stature and his perpendicular spirit, his flushed face, expressive protuberant eyes, high peremptory voice, extreme volubility, lucidity, and neatness of utterance, he reminded me of the gentry who figure in the revolutions of his native land. If he was not a fierce little Jacobin, he ought to have been, for I am sure that there were many men of his pattern on the Committee of Public Safety. He knew absolutely what he was about, understood the place thoroughly, and constantly reminded his audience of what he himself had done in the way of excavations and preparations. He described himself as the brother of the architect of the work actually going forward, that which has been done since the death of M. Viollet-le-Duc, I suppose he meant, and this fact was more illustrative than all the others. It reminded me, as one is reminded at every turn, of the democratic conditions of French life, a man of the people with a wife en bonnet, extremely intelligent, full of special knowledge, and yet remaining essentially of the people, and showing his intelligence with a kind of ferocity of defiance. Such a personage helps one to understand the red radicalism of France, the revolutions, the barricades, the sinister passion for theories. I do not, of course, take upon myself to say that the individual I describe, who can know nothing of the liberties I am taking with him, is actually devoted to these ideals. I only mean that many such devotees must have his qualities. In just the nuance that I have tried to indicate here, it is a terrible pattern of man. Permeated in a high degree by civilization, it is yet untouched by the desire which one finds in the Englishman, in proportion as he rises in the world, to approximate the figure of the gentleman. On the other hand, a nudité, a faculty of exposition, such as the English gentleman is rarely either blessed or cursed with. This brilliant, this suggestive warden of Carcassonne marched us about for an hour, haranguing, explaining, illustrating as he went. It was a complete little lecture, such as might have been delivered at the Lowell Institute, on the manner in which a first-rate place forte used to be attacked and defended. Our peregrinations made it very clear that Carcassonne was impregnable. It is impossible to imagine, without having seen them, such refinements of immurement, such ingenuities of resistance. We passed along the battlements and chemin de ronde, ascended and descended towers, crawled under arches, peered out of loopholes, lowered ourselves into dungeons, halted in all sorts of tight places, while the purpose of something or other was described to us. It was very curious, very interesting, above all it was very pictorial, and involved perpetual peeps into the little crooked, crumbling, sunny, grassy, empty cité. In places, as you stand upon it, the great towered and embattled enceinte produces an illusion. It looks as if it were still equipped and defended. One vivid challenge, at any rate, it flings down before you. It calls upon you to make up your mind on the matter of restoration. For myself, I have no hesitation. I prefer in every case the ruined, however ruined, to the reconstructed, however splendid." What is left is more precious than what is added. The one is history, the other is fiction, and I like the former the better of the two. It is so much more romantic. One is positive so far as it goes. The other fills up the void with things more dead than the void itself, inasmuch as they have never had life. After that, I am free to say that the restoration of Carcassonne is a splendid achievement. The little custodian dismissed us at last, after having, as usual, inducted us into the inevitable repository of photographs. 
These photographs are a great nuisance all over the Midi. They are exceedingly bad for the most part, and the worst, those in the form of the hideous little album panorama, are thrust upon you at every turn. They are a kind of tax that you must pay. The best way to pay is to be let off. It was not to be denied that there was a relief in separating from our accomplished guide, whose manner of imparting information reminded me of the energetic process by which I have seen mineral waters bottled. All this while the afternoon had grown more lovely, the sunset had deepened, the horizon of hills grown purple, the mass of the Canigou become more delicate, yet more distinct. The day had so far faded that the interior of the little cathedral was wrapped in twilight, into which the glowing windows projected something of their colour. This church has high beauty and value, but I will spare the reader a presentation of details which I myself had no opportunity to master. It consists of a Romanesque nave of the end of the eleventh century, and a Gothic choir and transepts of the beginning of the fourteenth and shut up in its citadel like a precious casket in a cabinet it seems or seemed at that hour to have a sort of double sanctity after leaving it and passing out of the two circles of walls i treated myself in the most infatuated manner to another walk round the cite it is certainly this general impression that is most striking the impression from outside where the whole place detaches itself at once from the landscape in the warm southern dusk it looked more than ever like a city in a fairy tale to make the thing perfect a white young moon in its first quarter came out and hung just over the dark silhouette it was hard to come away to incommode oneself for anything so vulgar as a railway train i would gladly have spent the evening in revolving round the walls of carcassonne but i had in a measure engaged to proceed to narbonne and there was a certain magic in that name which gave me strength. Narbonne, the richest city in Roman Gaul. End of section 9